continue your journey to the renewed mind. We continue now with our examination of apologetics, and we're looking at the crisis in language with respect to God talk. And in our last session, I ta talked about the problem that pantheism posed for meaningful discourse about God, and we saw the reaction into the 20th century in an attempt to reconstruct the supernatural. And we saw the introduction of this concept that God was wholly other. This was popularized by the theologian Karl Barth, who also gave a massive critique in his lifetime against what's called natural theology, which is an attempt to learn something about God from deductions drawn from nature. Bart was opposed to the intrusion into theology of categories of reason. He's one who, as we mentioned before with respect to the law of non-contradiction, said that unless a Christian or until a Christian is able to affirm both poles of a contradiction, that person has not yet reached maturity. I would revise that and say when a person is able to uh, affirm both poles of a contradiction, that person has finally reached insanity. But uh, in any case, in his antipathy against reason and against natural theology, he also leveled a radical assault against a concept that was deeply rooted in Christian history, particularly as it was articulated by St. Thomas Aquinas, which concept is called the analogia entis. Now this Latin phrase, analogia entis, is a technical term, but it's one that's critical for this whole discussion, because what it means is analogy of being. And Karl Barth attacked that, said that there is no analogy of being between God and man, because God is wholly other. He completely transcends us, so that He's totally different from us. Now to try to illustrate the problems that this poses for Christianity, let me tell the story, my favorite illustration of this, of an experience I had several years ago in Canada where I was talking with a group, a faculty of a particular uh, institute there that opposed natural theology and rationality and saw in my theology too heavy of a dependence on St. Thomas Aquinas, on Aristotle, on uh, logic and the like. And while we were having this discussion, they made the statement to me, I was speaking m by myself with their entire faculty, and one of their, their leading theologians said to me, uh, uh, we have a problem with your view of natural theology and so on because we believe that God is wholly other. I said, okay, if God is wholly other, uh, how do you know anything about Him? And he immediately responded, just as Karl Barth had responded earlier, that we know God not through rational speculation or deduction, but we know Him through revelation. That this transcendent God reveals Himself to us. And I said, well, let me ask you again, how does He reveal Himself to us? And they responded by saying, well, He reveals Himself to us through history, through the Bible, and preeminently through Christ. I said, I don't think that I'm getting through to you people. Maybe I'm just inarticulate and not framing the question the way I ought to. What I'm trying to get from you is how a being 
who is completely different from me, for whom there's no analogy of being between me and this being, how he can communicate anything to me about himself? How can he reveal anything through any means to us if there's absolutely no point of contact between us? If we are utterly dissimilar beings, what possible ground of communication could there be? And finally, the lights came on, and this theologian literally hit himself in the forehead like that and said, hmm, maybe I shouldn't have said that God is wholly other. I said, that's right, because as soon as you say that, you open the door to the skeptic who comes in and says to you that your language about God is meaningless. Because the philosopher understands the point I was just making to you, that if there is no similarity between God and man, then there's no common ground, no possible forum or avenue of communication. Let me try to explain that uh, further. Let's get rid of that. Some of you saw the movie years ago with uh, uh, Paul, uh, the race car driver, Paul Newman in it called Cool Hand Luke, where uh, Luke was the Christ figure in the film, by the way, uh, somebody's creative imagination. But uh, throughout the movie, they had problems with their being in the chain gang and so on. And more than once, the statement was made, what we have here is a failure to communicate. And that became one of the key lines in that movie. Well, what is necessary for communication is some common ground for people to have discussion. If you go to a foreign land, if you go to Russia, and you don't know anything about the Russian language, and the person you meet over there doesn't know anything about the English language, you have a hard time communicating, particularly if they tie your hands and you can't draw pictures or anything. You listen to the words, and the words just sound like gibberish to you, and yet when two Russians talk with each other, they know exactly what each one is saying because they both speak the same language. Well, I say I speak the same language with you who are Americans, and that may or may not be true. Remember Winston Churchill's comment? that uh, the Americans and the British are two people separated by a common language. <laughs> I like that line. <laughs> but uh, I talk to you and I say that this man here in the front row is sitting on a chair. And you, I think, have a pretty good understanding of what I mean by saying that he is sitting on a chair because you understand what the word chair refers to. Now, how do you understand the meaning of the word chair? I wonder how many thousands, maybe millions of chairs you've seen in your lifetime. And every time you've seen objects such as these chairs in this room, you register in your mind a relationship between this object and its function and that little English word, C-H-A-I-R. You develop an idea, as Plato uh, regarded it, of chairness from all these experiences of particular chairs that you have. So that your understanding of the meaning of the word chair is based in the final analysis of your ex particular experience of chairs. Now. No two people in this room have had exactly the same personal experience with chairs. Your experience with chairs is different from mine. You're much younger than I am, and I assume that you've seen far less chairs than I have. You live in a different time where the styles of chair change from, from uh, decade to decade. And there are chairs I'm familiar with from the 40s and 50s that you may not even recognize as chairs. 
And so we have a different background of experience of that word. So when I say chair, and you hear chair, you hear something different from what I'm saying. Because your understanding of the word chair is derived from your personal experience of chairs. And my understanding of chairs is derived from my personal experience of chairs. And if those experiences are different, to the extent to which they are different, there's miscommunication or differing assumptions. However, our experience of chairs is so overwhelmingly similar that we are still, even though we don't have an exact one-to-one -one correspondence of experience with respect to the word chair, the similarities of our experience of chairs are so close to one another, so carefully approximate each other, that any difference in understanding of the meaning of the term chair is infinitesimal and, in this case, irrelevant. You know what I mean when I say chair so that we can carry on a meaningful dialogue and we can have a meaningful co uh, conversation where you basically understand what I'm saying and I understand what you're saying. Now, the other day I was talking at the conference about divine transcendence and imminence. And one of the people who's in this room right now, I'm not going to identify, thought that she heard me say something when I was talking about imminence. She thought she heard me say, M&M's, and that I was talking about the candy that melts in your mouth rather than your finger. Why was that miscommunication possible? Because how many times had she ever heard the term eminence from a philosophical or theological perspective? Probably never before that day. She had no experience of that word. And her experience of it, the first time she heard it, was not all that dissimilar from mine, the first time I heard it when I spit my soup out on a table. And I'd have been better off if I would have heard the professor say M&M's <laughs> than what I actually heard. And so when you get more esoteric words, stranger words, less frequently used terms, then that, that whole complex of familiarity begins to fall away, and then we have difficulty uh, communicating, because you may not know what I'm talking about. If I use technical terms that are not common everyday terms that everybody else uses. So we un understand how language can fall down and break down when our familiarity with the words we're using with each other also breaks down. Now what does that have to do with God and apologetics? Again, if God is completely different from us, then we have no common ground, a common familiarity, and anything that He says to us about Himself has no relationship to us if He's totally different. If He says, I'm omnipotent, and we say, well, wait a minute, I understand something about omnipotence. I've never encountered an omnipotent being, but that word omnipotence, I can parse it and see that it means all-powerful, and power is a word I do understand. 